Buckle up, everyone. You are strapped in and ready for the Insurance Hour with me, your host, Carl Sussman, informing, educating, and entertaining Californians one policy at a time. This is Insurance Hour. Hello, hello. This is Carl Sussman, and you are tuned in to the Insurance Hour. I am your host, as always, here to answer all of your insurance-related questions, give you whatever advice I can for whatever it's worth. And today we have an interesting show. We're going to be doing our usual, talking about ways that you can maximize your insurance, talk about ways that you can save money as well, talk about ways to deal with claims, how to interact with your insurance agent or broker or the insurance company, all that good stuff. Remember, if you want, you can call us. We are at 559-656-0317, or you can email questions at insurancehour.com. Also, you can dial pound 250 and use keyword insurance you'll get to an agent right away. And with that, let's jump right in. I wanted to start out talking a little bit about insurance in general. I know, very exciting. Everyone's favorite topic. And that's exactly why I want to start out by talking about it, because I want to try and get an idea what it is about insurance that makes people mm, just, just not have the warm fuzzies. What is it about insurance that bothers people on some underlying level on some level that is not even something they even really recognize, or maybe they do. But let's talk in general. I think primarily one of the reasons that we have a frustration for an ins- for insurance policies in general is one where it's forced on us. Now, what does that mean forced on us? I, I know that there are exceptions to everything, but let's talk about our property insurance, our home insurance, for example. Chances are, if you purchase a home, you have a lease, a lease. You have a loan. If you have a loan on the house, the lender, the bank, wants to have, wants to be sure that their that their collateral, that house, has insurance on it. In case there's a loss, that house represents their collateral. So they want to be sure that there's a policy in place to protect their collateral. So from your perspective, from the consumer perspective, what bothers us is, well, they're well, we're already spending money to buy a house, right? which is a lot of people's major, largest investment that they'll ever have. They're taking their savings, they're taking their hard-earned dollars, and they're putting them, putting that toward the investment. On top of it, they're taking on an expense. They're going to have to pay every single month to maintain that investment. So they're shelling out their hard-earned dollars in a lump sum to start. They're promising to make significant payments every single month, usually for 30 years, sometimes even more. And on top of it, all of a sudden they're told, oh, here's one more expense that you're going to have to pay all the time, every month or annually, but you're going to have to have, and that's insurance on your property. So it's uh, it's one more thing that they have to sit there and say, uh, another expense. And I think that bothers a lot of us innately because we think, We don't like to be forced to do anything. We certainly don't like to be forced to have to spend money, especially when we're already spending money. So I think there's a large factor there as to why we just have sort of this frustration when we hear about insurance, because a lot of us, when we hear insurance, we think about the insurance policies that we have on our property. Now, this could be the same thing for car insurance. Same idea, smaller numbers. We want to get that awesome car. We want to lease that car. We want to purchase it, whatever the case might be. Let's take both examples. Let's say we lease or purchase the vehicle. So we've taken money, again, our hard-earned money, and we're putting that down and we're saying, okay, I want that. I want to purchase that. And you get your car. Well, if you're leasing it or you have a loan on it, basically you financed the purchase price, same idea. The bank is going to say, okay, that vehicle is our collateral in case you stop paying. We want to be sure that it's protected in the event that it's stolen or you trash it or something happens to that effect. So we're all of a sudden in a position where, again, we've taken our hard-earned dollars, we've put it down, we've saved it, we've put it down to get this vehicle, to get what we want, and now we're being told on top of it, we have another expense that we have to pay as long as we have that loan. It's frustrating and it's it just feels wrong. It feels like why like there's just always something else. It's not even just the price of the car. And it's not even just the tax. It's not even the interest rate. 
On top of it, we have an insurance policy that we have to pay for every single month or every single year, depending on how you're doing it. Frustrating, right? Understand that without that product, we wouldn't have the ability to finance vehicles. We wouldn't have the ability to be able to finance homes because no lender is going to turn around and say, okay, here's money. We don't need any protection against that asset. We don't need any type of protection against our collateral. More to the point, when you do have an interested party like a bank that has loaned you money for a vehicle or for a prop or for a piece of property, they even get notified in the event you stop paying for your insurance policy, which again, er, frustrating, right? Whose business is it if you're paying for your insurance policy or not? Well, again, the lenders are in this position of saying, we need to know if we're going to fork over tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars in money on your behalf for something of yours, we need to be sure it's protected. So while it's frustrating to be in this position where you're already putting all of this money in, you're already making all these promises to continue paying, you have yet another expense that you can't avoid. You need to pay the insurance premiums to protect those assets. Now, forgetting for a moment, it's good for you too. It's good to know that all that hard-earned money that you've taken and you've put down and you're paying every month, your asset is protected. Sure, the bank is caring about their money, but there's your money too, right? You have saved up all of this money for that property or for that vehicle. So while it's frustrating to feel forced to do it, you stop for a moment and think, okay, let's pretend there was no bank requirement that I, that I maintain insurance on this asset. How would I feel about driving that car around? Well, put a pin in that for a second, because even if you didn't, there are laws that say you have to have minimum amounts of insurance or liability insurance primarily when you're driving on public roads. So you would need to have a basic liability policy or in many states, you could do what's called posting a bond and that would satisfy the requirement for having liability protection without an insurance policy. So there is a little caveat to having to carry auto insurance liability wise. It's, it's not a good idea if you ask me, it's very low limits and you're pretty much on your own, but just so you know, it does actually exist. However, we're back to that whole point. So let's just say you don't have to carry insurance because the lenders, meh, they're just willing to take that chance and not protect their collateral. Are you, are you really in the place? Are you really in the position of thinking that eh, it's okay? I just won't protect my collateral. I won't protect my property. I won't protect the vehicle. If somebody smashes into it and they have no insurance, I'll just, oh, well, no car. Probably not. If it's your house and let's say you've paid it off, there's a great example. You don't have a loan on the house anymore. There is no bank saying, be sure there's insurance on this house. You have 100% equity in that house. Every penny of its value would go into your pocket if you sold it, minus fees, taxes, all that other good stuff. You get the point. Would you be okay not insuring that? It's an awful lot of money to just have out there in the event that there's a major disaster and something happens to the house or even a minor disaster or there are some ancillary um, products that come on homeowners insurance liability things of that nature protection for your personal property these are things that you might not think of when you're thinking about making that monthly payment to the insurance carrier but they are typically part of homeowners insurance policies so ask yourself hmm would i really want to go uninsured Probably not. Probably not. So I want you to stop and think about it because I do, and I talk to clients and they get frustrated, especially because the cost of property insurance is going up. The cost of auto insurance is going up. And we'll talk a little bit about why. Understand that even if you weren't forced to have to do it by a lender or some other third party that requires it, the chances are you probably would do it yourself anyway. So Perhaps if you step back and you think about it more along the lines of, I'm not being forced to do it because I would do it anyway, it's a little easier to swallow. You follow me what I'm saying? It's, it's not so much that I'm angry that I'm forced to spend this money on an insurance policy. It's, 
well, I would want to have this protection in the event something happens to my investment. That's really what you're doing is you are protecting your investment. Think about it like the FDIC. You know what that is? The Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. This is a fund that exists from the feds that protects your cash in the bank in the event that the bank you are with becomes insolvent. Very loosely described. That's the gist of it. What is that? Well, that's an insurance policy for your cash. That's a way for you to feel comfortable putting your money in the bank because the bank, even if the bank runs out of money, you have the backing of the feds. So we don't mind that, right? That's totally cool. You wouldn't necessarily feel as comfortable putting your entire life savings in a bank if you didn't know that the bank necessarily had the backing of the feds. Now, again, there are limits. I'm not a financial advisor, not a financial advice or any of that good stuff. But you see what I'm saying? Just because you're in a position where you have to do something, it doesn't mean necessarily that you wouldn't have done it on your own. Let's talk a little bit more about it right after this. California's insurance market can be challenging, but Sussman Insurance Agency knows the way. Trusted for two generations in home, auto, and personal insurance. Call 877-411-5200 or visit sussmaninsurance.com. Navigate with confidence. Hello, hello, and welcome back. This is Carl Sussman, and you are tuned in to Insurance Hour. I am here to answer your insurance-related questions. You can reach me at 559-656-0317 or questions at insurancehour.com. I am here. And before the break, we were talking about why we feel resentful about having to carry insurance policies. We were thinking about it. We were talking about it. And I think you get where I'm coming from. And I think we all understand why. We understand why we feel the way we do. But I want you to try and look at it like we were talking about Understand that you might be forced to do something which upsets you and at the same time be able to feel that, well, I would do it anyway. Because I think you would, right? You would want to protect your assets. So now that we've had an idea, we have an idea of talking about why we feel frustrated about it. What are some other things that happen when it comes to your insurance policy that frustrates you? So we can accept on some level that we need to have these policies. So why else do we have sort of that feeling that we get when we're talking about insurance. Let's talk about claims. Now, for the most part, I'll ask you, all of you right now, how many of you have ever read your insurance policy? Crickets. Very, very few. Very, very few. Every study that I've ever read shows very few people actually read their policies. Do you know, and this varies by state, but for the most part, it's, you know, it's across the board, you're required to read it. You actually have an obligation to read it and to understand what information is in it and to know what it is that you have. In the event of a claim, you might be a little frustrated because something's not covered. And you're going to say, why isn't that covered? And what will likely happen is the claims adjuster will take out your policy and give you the exact place in the policy where it describes whatever happened and how it's either excluded or it has a limit in how much it's paying out, they'll go over that with you. Hmm, frustrating, very frustrating. Now, I don't want to say fault. Whose fault is that? Because had you read the policy, you would have known what's covered and what's not. Perhaps you would have been able to go to your agent or broker or to the insurance carrier and say, hey, you know what? I see there's a limit in here for, let's just say, jewelry. I have a lot of jewelry. I'd like to raise that limit. But if you don't read the policy, you don't know these things. Now, some people will stop and say, no, wait a minute. I'm not an insurance expert. I'm a consumer. Isn't that the responsibility of my agent, broker, or the insurance company? And the answer is on some level, perhaps. Depends on your jurisdiction. Depends on the laws. But again, let's pretend for a moment that we're in a place where your insurance company or agent or broker has to go over your insurance policy with you in detail. Are you going to sit there while they read you the entire policy and say, any questions? Probably not. You might say, give me the highlights. Well, what's important to you as a highlight might not be important to someone else as a highlight. I'll give you an example. 
you might have an extensive gun collection. You might have firearms. You might have a wine collection, expensive wine. Usually those are different types of people, right? Point is, which one of those limits would you want to have highlighted? The answer is, it would depend. If you were someone collecting guns, or then you would want to have, be sure that the broker or agent tells you about the limits in the policy about that. If you're the wine connoisseur, you'd want to know if there are any limitations in the policy regarding how much they'll pay in the event of damage or loss to wine. How would the insurance agent or broker know what to highlight? Difficult, right? Everybody's different. And that's just one example. Insurance policies are fairly comprehensive. They do list a lot of information. So it would be difficult, even under the best of circumstances, for an agent or broker to go over every aspect of an insurance policy. Having said that, they will usually, and again, it depends on what state, requirements can vary, go over some things that they might say are significant. I'll give you an example. When you receive your insurance policy, there's what's called the deck sheet, the declaration page. It's that cover page. It lists your name, the policy effective date, the primary coverages, let's call them primary coverages. If it's a car, it might list the vehicle. If it's your house, it'll have the address. If it, it lists the amount of coverage on the structure, if it's a house, it will list deductibles if you have coverage for the car. Now, this is by far not the entire insurance policy. This is just the part that the insurance carrier is showing you these particular coverage limits and what they are for you. The insurance policy itself has an entire list of additional items that will reflect coverage within the policy. It's not really possible to go over all of those issues with the insurance carrier or with an agent or broker. You do have to stop, take a few minutes or more, and read it over. Skim it over, if nothing else. Get an idea of what the coverage types are that you have, because again, it's impossible for a third party, whether it be an insurance agent or broker or the carrier, to know exactly what your hot button items are, to know exactly what's important to you. What types of exposures do you have that are unique to what somebody else might have? You see what I'm saying? The insurance application will ask some questions and it might give an idea of certain things that will trigger, that will trigger you. Might, for example, it might ask, if you have firearms in your home, there's actually legislation pending in California for that, uh, for that exact issue. So that might be a point for you to say, oh, I'm a gun collector. I should probably ask if there are limits in the policy about that. So there are certain things in your application for property insurances, which is the example I'm giving, where you might be able to get a hint and, and think, well, maybe I should ask about that since I see it's a question on the application. It's a fair bet that that is either being underwritten for or against, or there's a limit within the policy. It's a good point, by the way. If you're being asked a specific question on any insurance application, it's a pretty good bet that the reason they're asking is for one of three reasons. One, because you may or may not be eligible for the product based on your answer. Two, they want to see about a surcharge, depending on what that is, or a discount based on your answer. Or three, both. There's a reason. You're not going to be asked a question that doesn't have some value for the insurance company. They're asking questions because they're utilizing that to come up with your price. They're utilizing that to come up with your, uh, your uh, eligibility. And you should also look at those questions and be sure that you're answering them correctly. Number one, always answer them correctly. Otherwise, you could put yourself in a position, first of all, and we've talked about this many times, of not having your claim covered and having the policy rescinded and all sorts of bad things happen. But you should also pay attention to those questions when you're on answering them honestly, because those are issues that you should perhaps think about and talk with your agent or broker about, because they might be some, there might be something to it that's unique to you. You understand my example about guns. There, are, there might be a question on an auto insurance application, let's just say, that asks, have you put any post-factory equipment on your vehicle? Okay, you might just say yes or no and move on. I have not added anything to it. Or you may have spent a ton of money either putting a wrap on the vehicle, changing the stereo out, changing the tires. There's all sorts of things that can be done to a vehicle. 
So instead of just answering the question and moving on, when you answer that question, you should stop and say to yourself, oh, they're asking me this. Probably means I should ask because I'm not the average Joe when it comes to this. I have spent significant dollars on my vehicle after, the, after purchasing it. It's worth noting why. You understand that when an insurance carrier is coming up with a price for insuring a vehicle, and there's lots of factors that go into auto insurance, I'm just talking about what does this vehicle cost to insure? That one factor, they really have only one thing to go based on, right? What does that vehicle cost? If you've changed that in some way, then they have no way to price for it unless they know. So if they can't price for it, you shouldn't expect to get a payout based on modifications you've made that they didn't know about. Again, one of those frustrations, but it makes sense when you think about it. If they're charging a price for a vehicle that costs $50,000, because that's what the year, make, and model of that vehicle is, but you've put another ten grand in it, and they don't know, they're still charging you premium for a $50,000 vehicle. If there's a loss, that's what they're going to base it on. They don't have any other way of knowing. The, the onus is on you to go to the insurance company and say, hey, this is not your run-of-the-mill car. I've done X, Y, and Z to it. And be sure you have the correct policy so that you can tell them, hey, in the event of a loss, I want to be paid based on this amount, not the normal standard amount that you might expect to see for this vehicle. Same thing with your house. People will purchase a home and they'll do work on it. Sometimes they'll even add a second story. They'll add a pool. They'll do things like that. Now, what do you think happens if they don't tell the insurance carrier that they've made these additions? Well, it's not, in, it's not going to be covered for the most part, right? Because again, the insurance carrier, when you purchased your, pro, your home policy, said, how many stories is it? We're using you know, silly, straightforward examples. And you say, one story. And they say, okay, here's the price. But now it's two stories. But you haven't told anybody. Maybe you don't want the price to go up. So you don't tell anybody. And there's a loss. And you want your two-story house to be rebuilt. And the insurance carrier says, whoa, two stories. The application says one story. When did it become two stories? Oops, you can see where we're going with this. It's a problem. It becomes a problem. And this is nobody's fault specifically because I can understand we don't want to pay more for our insurance than we have to. And at the same time, we want to be sure we have things covered properly. And, and this is these are those two areas that are pulling in opposite directions because more coverage will typically cost, say it again, more money. So if you make a change to your property, if you've made changes from when you originally purchased the insurance policy, you need to let the carrier know, and yes, they are going to charge you more money. You have spent money. If you've put a second story on your house, and now that house is worth an additional, forget what it's worth. Let's say you've spent $200,000 to put a second story on your house, or you've just done work on your house. You've improved it, you've done things, and it's cost $200,000 out of your pocket. You've spent that money. Don't you want that protected if there's a loss? Of course you do. You've spent that money. It's gone. You want to have that protection. You want to know that in the event there's a claim, they're going to pay you based on what you've put into that property. And it then follows that you need to let them know. And at the same time, you should expect the premium to be higher because you're insuring something that will cost more. Makes sense, right? It costs more to rebuild, the premium costs more in general terms, right? There's lots of other factors that go into it, but you should expect that. And the truth is you should want that because by paying that additional premium, you're able to have that comfort of knowing, okay, I did it right. They know I have this additional coverage that I asked for. Again, read your policy, be sure. But understand that, yes, if you're going to have more coverage, you're going to have to pay more in premium. And if you're spending your own hard-earned dollars putting it into this car, adding on to your home, yes, it, you need to insure it. You need to have coverage for it. You need to let the insurance carrier or your agent or broker know so they can do what's appropriate to be sure that you have coverage to protect that new investment, those actual dollars that you've gone and put into the property or into your vehicle. Make sense? 
If you have questions, give me a call. Again, I'm happy to discuss all of this with you. 559-656-0317 and or you can email questions at insurancehour.com. That's what I'm here for. I want to help you understand what it is, why it is, and going forward, you'll have a better idea and hopefully not have that same feeling of a little bit of resentment about having to have or wanting to have and should and should be, that doesn't make sense, and should, that you should have insurance to protect your assets. Facing the maze of California's insurance market? Let Sussman Insurance Agency be your ally. Expertise in all personal insurance needs for over two generations. Call 877-411-5200 or visit sussmaninsurance.com. Together, we can do this. Hello, hello. This is Carl Sussman. You are tuned in to Insurance Hour. Thank you again for being here. Remember, I am here to answer all of your insurance-related queries, whatever they might be. You can call at 559-656-0317. Email your questions to questions at insurancehour.com. Or if you want to get an agent right away, just dial pound 250, keyword insurance, and you'll get a broker right away. All right. We've been talking about, well, insurance resentment. <laughs> for lack of a better way to put it, we've been talking about insurance resentment. Why do we feel that way? What is it that's fueling that feeling? And some other ways to try and look at the reality of insurance companies. I thought after having gone through that, hopefully you have a better feeling about why it is that your insurance policies are not there to upset you. The mandatory requirements that lenders will put on you to purchase a policy is not necessarily something that you should just be upset at and why. If you missed any part of the show, remember you can catch a replay on YouTube or on a podcast. Just check online at insurancehour.com. You'll find everything you need there. Now, we talked a little bit about claims as well. What else is there about insurance policies that people don't understand? I'll, I'll talk to you about one right now that I find near and dear to my heart. As a broker uh, for 30 some odd years, I will pause for you to say, oh, you we must have started when you were a teenager. No, no. All right, I'll keep my day job. Anyway, what is what is an agent or broker and how is the relationship with you and them and the insurance carrier? It's an interesting topic and it's an interesting question that a lot of people truly don't understand. And it's different and it varies from state to state. Now let's talk a little bit about that. Some states will say that an insurance agent or broker is l almost literally a, an, an order taker. The responsibility is 100% on the agent or the broker, I'm sorry, on the, on the consumer to say what it is they want. And if they want, excuse the expression, crap, they got to give them crap. That's it. Other states, and this is the other side of the spectrum, say that it's the agent or broker's responsibility to educate the consumer on what it is that they should have, shouldn't have, and there needs to be more of a dialogue and explanation. Your mileage may vary, depends on the state, depends on the regulatory body, depends on the product that we're talking about. Is it home, is it auto, is it life? There's all sorts of factors that come in play. What I find is a factor among everybody is people expect an insurance agent or broker to know secrets, let's put it that way. They expect them to know secrets. They expect them to know what it is that the that their client needs without the client always telling them. Now, I'm not saying that to be obnoxious. I'm just saying that in the 30 years or so that I've done this, I've come across situations where consumers assume that we will know certain things. We will know that they have a lot of fine art. We don't know unless you tell us, right? Is it on the agent or broker to go through and say, all right, let's have a little get to know each other party. Let's find out everything about you. Do you like fine art? Do you have expensive jewelry? Do you... There are so many factors. There are so many parts of an insurance policy. We're talking about property insurance right now. It would be next to impossible to go over everything. So what I like to try and say is, as a general rule, regardless of where you are, it's important for you to keep in mind that what 
responsibilities you have and what responsibilities an insurance agent or broker has and what responsibilities an insurer has can vary widely. Who suffers at the end of the day is consumers, it's us, right? We're the ones that if we don't have the proper coverage and there's a loss, we're the ones that have a problem, right? Sure, we can go after the broker. Sure, we can go after the insurance company and that happens. But, the, but what does it really mean? It means that we're the ones suffering. We've lost something. We were in some way have not been made whole by the insurance policy the way we wanted to. So look at this as sort of a PSA. And I'm talking about public service announcement, please. Take it upon yourself to ask questions of your insurance agent or broker, no matter how good they are. And let's face it, just like everybody, and just like every industry, there are good agents and there are not as good agents out there. Just like there are good doctors and bad doctors. I'll never forget, I was told once, many, many years ago, that uh, the doctor that graduates with a C minus average from med school still is MD after their name. It's true, right? Same thing with insurance agents or brokers. They pass that test, and once they've passed that test, they have the license. It doesn't matter if they missed one or just passed by one question, which always reminds me, when I'm talking to fellow agents or brokers, new agents usually, and, and people that we talk about for interviewing and bringing on board our team, my big joke is that when they take their insurance test, if they pass, they tell everyone, oh, it's a piece of cake, I, I passed it with flying colors, I don't think I missed anything. If they fail, then they say, oh, I just missed it by one question. Just one. Of course, you know that's not the case either way, likely, but that's the way people always describe it because it is a pass or fail. You don't get a grade when you take an insurance exam, at least in some states, you just get a pass or fail after they, they add up the, the correct and incorrect answers. So understand that depending on who your agent or broker is, you might have the A plus, you might have the C minus. It just depends. It just depends. And since you're the one, I'm the one, we are all the ones, we're all consumers that have insurance policies, it's so much easier to just start out from a place of saying, okay, I'm looking to get insurance. I'm going to ask questions, right? I understand, or at least you should now, that depending on where I am, there are certain responsibilities that an agent or broker or an insurance company should have. However, since at the end of the day, this is me, this is about my stuff, I'm going to take a little bit more of a proactive approach to being sure that I do have the right coverage that I need. Because that's the, the best claim is no claim, right? We all agree with that. Because if you don't have a claim, no loss. No loss is good, right? We all like to not have bad things happen. A loss is bad. So if we end up in the position where there is a loss, let's at least have done everything we can to be sure that we have the right type of coverage, that we have the right limits, we have the right sublimits, we have the right policy type altogether. Having said that, let's also remember something else. Insurance policies are there in the event that you may, that there's a loss, right? I've talked to people over the years and we'll be talking about their home or whatever the case might be. And I'll hear things to the effect of, yeah, I don't need to deal with that because if, if something happens, I have an insurance policy for that. That might be true. That's also typically the person where when something does happen and they have a claim, and then their risk profile changes and they end up having a higher premium after that claim, get very frustrated. Well, I, I, this is why I have insurance. Why is it that my price has gone up because I've had a claim? Let's talk about that entire chain of events. You have a policy, you have a loss, and your premium goes up. Those three things. Let's talk about that. Why does that happen and why does it actually make sense even though it's really frustrating? When you purchase an insurance policy, you have a certain exposure, right? You have a certain likelihood of having a claim. It might be high, it might be low, depends. Once you've had that policy, you're just moving right along. Now, put a pin in that. Remember I started out by saying some people will say, well, if I don't, I don't have to worry about, let's just say, keeping my roof 
up to date because if there's a leak, I have an insurance policy. By doing that, you are setting yourself up to have a claim, right? I mean, you're, you're literally saying, it's okay, uh, it's called deferred maintenance. I won't deal with it because if there is a claim, I have an insurance policy. So you're almost setting yourself up for the eventuality of having a claim. And remember I started out by saying the best thing is no claims. So now you've had a loss because you didn't maintain your roof, let's say. The insurance company pays money. And now when the policy comes up for renewal, and renewal is like, um, sort of like you're starting from scratch. Every year when that policy comes up for renewal, the insurance carrier is going to look at the risk and determine what the risk factors are. Again, slight variations by state regulations, but for the most part, that's why policies renew every year. It's because your risk profile might change. If you're driving, you might be getting older. You're for sure getting older. If it's your house, perhaps it's, you know, when you purchased it, you said your roof was X number of years old. Now it's one more year old. You might be getting to a point where the carrier is going to want to be sure you have done maintenance to upgrade, not upgrade, to maintain or replace the roof. So you have to sort of re-up every year. That's why policies, you don't purchase a policy for your car and have it forever no matter what. What if you turn into a reckless driver and you start causing a ton of accidents? Well, the insurance carrier is going to have to say, well, when we started with this person, there were no claims happening. He had never had a ticket or accident. But now in the last 12 months, he's had two accidents and three tickets. Clearly, this is going to cost more money to insure this person going forward. So there's a reason policies renew. So when you're in a position of having a policy and having a claim, understand that you are a different risk at that point than you were the day before that loss happened. And it makes sense. I mean, it's a fact. Yesterday, you were someone that had never had a car accident ever, or let's just say in the last 10 years. Now you're someone that had a car accident where you ran over an animal and you're getting sued and things are happening. That's different. You are a different driver now. You have a different history of driving than you did yesterday. So if you walk in the door with the history of never having had an accident versus you walk in the door with the history of an accident or two or whatever the case might be, which one's going to cost more money? Well, the one with the accident, right? And, and we understand that logically. It just frustrates us because emotionally we feel like, but, 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 right? That's why I have an insurance policy. And the answer is you're right. And the insurance company paid, hopefully. The insurance carrier did what the policy provisions say, and they did what they were supposed to do. And as the policy comes up for renewal, they will reevaluate the policy and your risk profile at that point. And they will price it accordingly or non-renew it or renew it or change provisions in the policy again, depending on the state that you're in. Think about that a little bit and we'll come back to it in a moment. Are you feeling lost in the search for the right insurance? Making call after call, only to find no one willing to go that extra mile for you? At Sussman Insurance Agency, we understand that frustration, and we're here to change your experience. While many might shy away from jumping through hoops, at Sussman Insurance Agency, we're prepared to leap. That's not just what we do, it's who we are. Our dedicated team doesn't just offer policies, we provide solutions. Solutions born from persistence, expertise, and a genuine commitment to finding you the best coverage possible. Sussman Insurance Agency, going the extra mile every time. Hello, hello, hello. This is Carl Sussman. This is Insurance Hour. Thank you again for being here. I'm here to help answer your insurance-related questions. You can reach me at 559-656-0317. And of course, send your questions to questions at insurancehour.com. Or if you want a broker right away, just dial pound 250, keyword insurance, and boom, you will get someone that can help you. Before the break, we were talking a little bit about the frustration we feel when we purchase an insurance policy and that we have a claim, and then we have to see the price go up, and why that's frustrating, and it is frustrating, 
And hopefully you have a better idea now of why that is, why it happens. So maybe it won't bother you as much as it did before because it makes sense. If you missed it, by the way, you can catch this again on YouTube. You can catch it on a podcast. Just go to insurancehour.com. You'll, you'll find copies of this all over the place so you can go back and listen to what you missed. So initially, we were talking about why no claim is better than a claim. It's always better. Claims are losses, right? It means something bad happened. When it's, a, when it's been in a vehicle, what do we call it? A car accident? They're not car deliberates, right? It's an accident, so, but it's still bad. You don't want to have them. You want to avoid them. So a little bit of prevention can go a long way for car accidents and claims on your property. And I want to spend this time to go over a little bit of information about that for you. When it comes to driving, driving is complicated. And if, you're, if, you, if you doubt that driving is complicated, you can see how they're trying to come out with self-driving cars, computer, <coughs> excuse me, computer modeling that will do things like drive your vehicle and how difficult it is. That's because driving is really hard. There's a lot that goes into it. A lot, a lot that goes into it. You need to be aware of so many things all the time and things happen so quickly. So understand driving is difficult. There are some things that you can do preemptively to try and prevent an accident. So let's go over a few of those things because we agree now. We don't like having claims. We don't like having accidents. So what can we do other than try and do some things to prevent them? Here's the first thing you can do. Think about driver's driver's training. You took a driver's training class. They gave you some ideas of things to do before you drive a car. I can actually remember a few of them. They were kind of silly in hindsight, even though I can understand them. For example, one of them said straight out, every time before you get in your car, you're supposed to walk around the car, check the tires, give them a kick. You're supposed to check the brake lights. You're supposed to do all these things. Does anybody do that? Of course not. Should they? Hmm. Probably not realistic to do. Having said that, would it hurt? Would it potentially prevent an accident? Yeah, it probably would. So let's talk about some less dramatic, easier things that you can do to prevent having a car accident. And you know where I'm going with this. If you don't, here it comes. Distracted driving. You've heard this buzz phrase. You've heard people talk about it. You've probably heard people talk about it so much you just want to vomit already. Ask yourself this. Do you drive while texting? Okay, we know we're not supposed to. Hopefully you don't. Most people do. And I'm not talking about having the full-on conversation while they're driving. I'm talking about even this quick thing. You're driving, somebody texts you, and you grab the phone, and you look at it, and you give a quick message back. Or somebody texts you, and you look at your watch if you have your text there, and you just quickly respond. Okay? That's distracted driving. That's texting while driving. It's really, really hard not to do that. We are so conditioned to staying in contact. We are so afraid if, of not responding that we can't help ourselves sometimes. But we need to. We need to do better. I will give you a challenge. For one day, one day, which is not a long time, one day, the next time you get in your car in the morning, take your phone, whip it into the back seat. You can't touch it. You just can't. And drive. You might hear it make a noise. You might really feel like you want to pick it up and do something with it, but you can't. It's in the back seat. Please don't then turn around and try and get it. Okay, you defeat the whole purpose and some. Try in little ways to be a more focused driver. Texting and driving. I don't even want to get into what other some other things people do, whether it be scrolling through social media while they're in traffic. Oh, I'm going slow. It's bumper to bumper. It's fine. I'll just sort of you know, keep an eye here and keep an eye there. Try this little test sometimes. I'll do it with you right now. Take your, your finger, put it in front of you right now and focus on it. Now, keep focusing on it and then look forward at the furthest object you can and focus on it. All right, keep focusing on the object as far away from you as possible. Now quickly focus on your finger again. And then back to the item in the distance. Do that three or four times and I'll tell you what you're going to realize. 
there's an actual measurable amount of time. And if you do that little test enough times, you'll be able to feel it where you can actually see that it takes time to focus your eyeballs on an object that's close, like your phone, and an object that's far away, like the car in front of you. And we don't realize that. But there, that delay, not to mention the fact that your brain also has to process something happening and react to it. That time is critical. Yes, you're going bumper to bumper. You feel like you're going three, four miles an hour. What's the big deal? Do you know how many claims I see for those little bumper to bumper accidents because someone was just holding their phone bored and they would keep glancing at their phone and then up, glancing at their phone and up. And just one time, as they happen to glance down, the car in front of them stops, bump, and there it goes. It happens. By the way, and we talked about this in an earlier show, there is no such thing as a small accident anymore, unfortunately, because vehicle costs are so much higher than they used to be, and repair costs are so much higher than they used to be. So understand that there really is no small accident. So that little bumper to bumper accident that you just kind of tapped someone or maybe there's a scratch or, or just the bumper has to be replaced is going to be a much bigger deal than it should. But I digress. We need to focus more on how we drive to prevent accidents from happening. Statistics show that the level, the severity of accidents and the frequency at which they're happening today is almost three times as high as before the pandemic. Three times. What is that all about? It's almost like we all forgot how to drive for a short time. I can't tell you why it is. I have no idea why it is. I can only tell you what the numbers show. A lot of that, I'm sure, is going to be attributed to the fact that we are more connected to our devices. And so we're driving more distracted. Maybe during the pandemic, because we were so into our devices and computers and just things, because that's how we stayed connected to the world, we, we just kept that connectivity feeling with us as we got back and started driving. Maybe, there you go, you want that idea? Take it and run with it. Do some research. I'd love to know. Whatever the reason is, people are driving and having more claims and more accidents, which is bad. Because it's bad to have an accident. It's bad to have a loss. It's bad to have a claim. Collectively, that raises everyone's blood pressure, figuratively speaking, if you know what I mean, all these claims and accidents. Not to mention it hurts our pocketbooks because we are going to be paying more for insurance. More claims, more payouts, higher premiums. Doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure that out because you and I can say that and be annoyed by it, but it's true. And so the good drivers, the people that are perhaps not driving as distracted, they are paying the price, literally, for people that are not. Because when collectively as a society, we are driving faster and more distracted, having more accidents and more severe accidents and more claims are being paid out and more is being paid out. We all pay the price for that. Literally, we all pay the price for that. So let's try and focus on distracted driving and what we can do to do it zero times a day, to do it 0% of the time. And if you have to start with baby steps, then do it. I do. I will tell you, I work very, very hard. When I'll get a text, I'll use that auto reply. So the car, the, the phone will respond and say, I'm driving, please text me. I'll tell you a quick, funny story. When that option first came to cell phones, you were able to program exactly what it says when you put it in that driving mode. And I think the default is something like, you know, I'm like vehicle, I mean, do not disturb mode because I'm driving or something like that. So I changed it and it said words to the effect of, aren't you lucky I turned on this mode because I'm driving and you could have just caused me to have an accident. It's true. I got a lot of nasty voicemails for that. And the point is, just tell people on that message, I'm driving, please call, right? Because you can talk. By the way, Talking on the phones does show to be a distraction as well, but what are you going to do? It's the lesser of two evils. We're not going to sit in our car and be completely disconnected from the world as much as that might be the safest way to possibly drive. Have them call. Set that little away message I'm driving to say, I'm driving, please call. That's it. Four words. I'm driving, please call. 
What's interesting, you'll find, you'll find two things. One, people won't call, which I'm not quite sure why. And two, you'll realize that even if they don't, the text message that was coming in that would have distracted you, that you would have picked up your phone, that you would have responded to, it could wait. It wasn't something specific that you needed to know and respond to that second. Guess what? If it's so important that you need to hear about it that second, they will call, right? If the fire, if there's a fire, they will call. Horrible way for me to put it as, as a broker. But if there's something that critical going on, they will call you. That's auto insurance. That's distracted driving, okay? Now, let me just give you 30 seconds on what you can do for your house to prevent losses. It's called, actually, I'll even whittle it down to one thing. It's called maintain your house. Pride of ownership. Pretend you're selling it and you look around and you say, oh, I have to do all these things before we list it. Why are you waiting? You live there now. Do it now. Put on the new roof. Paint the house. Be sure your gutters are cleaned out. Be sure that your plumbing is up to date. And, you've, and if there were leaks that you've replumbed and, and you've done things to prevent further loss, do those things now. Maintain your property. It's called deferred maintenance, pride of ownership, call it what you like. Do things to prevent your house from having a loss. There are a ton of them and you know what they are because those are the things you're thinking you have, that you have coverage for. Do them now. Prevent the loss from happening so you don't have a claim and your premium doesn't go up later. I hope this has been helpful. I hope you understand that the idea here is to take a little bit of self-responsibility, take a little bit of preemptive work, whether it be for your property or for your vehicle, and be sure that you do whatever you can. You can't avoid everything, but you do whatever you can do to prevent the likelihood of having a claim. It will pay you back in dividends. And as a society, if we can adopt more of that mentality, we will all benefit from it in the long term. All of us with lower premiums and a more competitive insurance environment for everybody. I do want to thank all of you for taking the time to listen today. I know insurance is not necessarily the most sexy concept. It's not the most exciting thing in the world. It is important that you understand what it is you're getting, what you should be looking for, red flags, you name it. You just need to know more than you used to. Things are more complicated than they used to be. If you have any questions, please reach out to me directly. You can email your questions to questions at insurancehour.com or call and leave a voicemail at 559 559- 656-0317. Educating and entertaining Californians one insurance policy at a time. This is Insurance Hour. This show is dedicated to Shamrock Papa.